Hello and welcome to our quick start of Auto Elevate by CyberFox. So we're going to be walking you through some basic setup and configuration of the Auto Elevate platform. Um, the first thing you should have gotten an email with uh, a link to reset your password um, and create your 2FA and be able to log you on the platform. So that's going to be, you know, our step one is to get logged in, find that email, go ahead and click that link, get logged in. Um, and then from there, you should be at a dashboard and there will be basically nothing installed, nothing set up yet. And we're going to take you through start to finish, at least just doing one agent deployment manually. Um, and there are a number of methods to deploy this through RMM tools. Um, just search for your RMM tool. If you don't find it, just do a search for PowerShell on the support site. And there'll be a number of different scripts and methodologies that will help you auto deploy this in mass to lots of systems. But for now, we're just going to focus on deploying a single agent and just walking through the basics of the platform, just so you can understand how to use it, where to go, what do the modes mean, stuff like that. So that's going to be our time today. So let's do it. We're going to start by going to settings. So we'll try to keep this so you can all follow along. So we're going to go to settings. And you want to click uh, in the first one is going to be copy to clipboard. What that's doing is it's getting the license key in the clipboard. And then from there, you're going to click download and that will pull down the agent MSI. So a couple things with this, the license key is the same for all customers or individual setups, it doesn't matter. The license key is per instance. Um, and so it's just one key for everything. So you'll be using the same one. Um, this will get you the most recent uh, agent MSI installer. And then what I'm gonna do is just show you really quick over here. When you run this installer, so if you're running this on a VM or if you're putting it on your own machine, basically this is what you're gonna see when you do a manual install. So you're going to put the license key in that we copied to the clipboard, fill in a company name, short initials, and then location can be whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's essentially there uh, to group and organize machines where you may want to apply different rule sets to them. So it could actually be physical locations or it could just be like uh, laptops, desktops, or um, you know, engineers, sales, marketing, things like that. So it really doesn't matter how you decide that you want to use that. Um, if you are using an RMM tool, you can have it follow the company name and location setup if your RMM has that using some variables and stuff inside uh, uh, some of the scripting. So that's the installation. Um, you're going to run that. You're going to see UAC come up and then go ahead and either click yes if you're an administrator or put credentials in if you're not an administrator. And then once that's done, you'll see a little swirl, blue swirl on your mouse wheel that lets you know the service started. And then it takes about 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds to get started and then go ahead and check into the server. So once you see that, come back over here, go to the portal. We're gonna go up to computers and then you should see your company uh, whatever company you created in that uh, in the form with that location and then that system will be there okay and it should be little green status next to it um, if on some occasions uh, sometimes the agent is still pulling an in inventory you can just click the refresh right here and that will get you the most recent data so a couple things to be aware of on this page. So this is the computer screen. You can sort and organize these uh, by simply just dragging things up into the header like that and dropping them. And that will allow you to create your own unique data views of which you can save over here. I'll show you how to make some of those in a minute as well. So the key thing you're looking at here is this. You want to make sure that UAC is turned on. So the primary function of this is as an elevation tool is a UAC interrupt. So it interrupts UAC, allows us to control the process, and then when it's appropriate, we will go ahead and put the proper credentials and inputs and stuff into the UAC dialog when it's appropriate, right? And when things are approved. But in order for that to happen, it needs to be turned on. And we do see this a lot where um, the admin level may be uh, turn down or UAC itself, especially in some older software applications where they've told you to turn UAC off completely. Um, if UAC is off, there's nothing for us to intercept. So you want to make sure that is turned on. And a good setting is on and dimmed, level three, level four. You can also see who's logged in and you can see how they're logged in. So if this was your machine and you were the administrator, it'll say administrator there. Um, now, 
there is a feature called remove admin. Um, and that feature can allow us to do and help. Well, it helps us to allows us to help you clean up the local administrators group. So if I were to hover over this, you can see the members of the local admin group. Now, right now, this is just some Azure AD stuff. So if you do see something that looks similar to this uh, with the uh, SIDs in there, that's just Azure. And then, of course, there's the built in admin. We can't do anything with that. But what we could do is if this account, Bill Morgan, for example, was a member of this group as an active user, I could remove that account from the local admins group. So that way the next time they logged in, they would no longer be an admin. So it's just there to help you try to police and clean up the local administrators group. Now that is off by default because currently our agent automatically deploys in audit mode. So let's talk about some of the agent modes so that we know how to use them. So check the box in front of uh, the computer that you've deployed or any computer you may have deployed and just simply say actions. Just click there. You're going to get a list of items and things that you can do. So there's two areas that we're going to be focused on. The majority of the conversation today is going to be around elevation and then we'll talk a little bit about the blocking utility as well. So we're going to start with elevation. So we go, we're going to deploy in audit mode. Um, that audit mode is do no harm. So essentially that means um, we're just listening for UAC events. We're going to record those when they occur. That's all we're going to do. We're not going to make any changes to the system. We're not going to follow any rules. We're not going to do anything. So generally the way this is used and deployed um, is a pretty straightforward four-step process. Step one, Right here, deploy the agent in audit mode. Step two, collect elevation events. So those elevation events can happen organically or they can happen if you force an event. So if you know what people are using privilege for or you know you have applications that require privilege to update, think of things like uh, QuickBooks and Revit and AutoCAD and uh, UPS WorldShip and Bluebeam and Foxit and you know all these other Dentrix and a whole bunch of other applications, right? So if you already know about those, simply go to a, uh, put an agent on that machine, right-click those applications, say run as administrator. When UAC presents, just say no. And what that does is allows us to capture the elevation events in our system. From there, you're going to build some elevation rules based off of the events that you were curating. And then, and you're not going to make a rule for everything, but obviously the key things that need elevation that we want to elevate automatically, we're going to make policies for those. And then from there, if, as long as we're happy with the rule set we've got, from there, we're going to go to generally to live mode. There are two sort of agent modes here that you could use the system in. Generally, most are going to use it in live mode. And live mode means runs any rules that are out there. So whatever rules you create, the system will abide and follow those. It'll do the elevations automatically. If there's no rule, then the system will send this uh, that request into the console as an elevation request. And you can answer that in real time, and then it will automatically disposition on the other end for you. Right? And there's some dialogues and, and things that we'll show you that come up during that process. Now, policy mode. This is a little different. When you need auto elevate to be quiet, um, think a good example would be like a kiosk. I don't want pop ups and messages and all kinds of things in like a, you know, sort of a lockdown scenario. So policy mode will run and elevate anything that you've created a policy for. But if there's no rule for it, instead of sending in a request, we just simply exit. UAC will present itself exactly as it does today. It'll be like we weren't even there. So if there's a rule, it'll run it. Uh, so it'll do those elevations in the background, no problem. But if there's no rule, instead of sending a request, we're just going to exit and UAC will just present itself. Now down here, there's one other mode. Now this one right here is important. So this is how technicians can be technicians, right? Help desk staff, engineers, analysts, whatever the case might be. When I need someone on this machine to do technical work, I want to, uh, first and foremost, I want to turn off any of the policies we may have created because I may need to do things that maybe a policy wouldn't let me. But as an engineer, I can do that. This is designed to get around um, using the shared credentialed process. 
We know sharing credentials, sharing usernames, sharing passwords, copying passwords into our clipboards, things like that are not safe and secure methods of operating. Um, we do them because it's the easiest way to manage uh, a lot of systems, you know, with not a lot of staff. But it's not the best security practice. Doesn't matter what security framework you look at, it's not a good idea. This helps to eliminate that. So now we can turn it on technician mode, and there are two ways to operate this. Uh, the first mode is um, you turn it on. You can do it from the menu here. I don't recommend necessarily doing this unless it's an emergency. Maybe it's a vendor on site or you really trust the person because if I set this to on, it will take that machine and give them full administrator, whoever's sitting there, for 15 minutes by default. The way you want to use it is through the QR code process. So you would use a hotkey, control alt a that hotkey will bring up a QR code. You're going to use our mobile app, which is Auto Elevate Notify. It's in the, your respective app store. Get signed in, put your 2FA, and then you can use the QR scanner in that app to scan yourself into that machine, put the machine instantly into um, technician mode, and then you can do whatever you want. Shuts off all the rules. You don't need a username and a password. You don't know any credentials. You don't have to be an administrator, nothing. It'll do everything for you. So those are the modes, all right? Now, what I wanna do now is I wanna generate some elevation events so that we can walk through some basic rule creation. Now, while I have a bunch of rules in our system here, yours is currently probably empty. So let's go ahead and do this. So we're gonna go over to our, our machine here that we have our agent on. And it doesn't really matter what you do, but I would recommend doing something like maybe Microsoft Edge or uh, something simple that you have on there, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, um, Adobe, or if you have applications that you want to make rules for like QuickBooks or Foxit or something like that, by all means, right click, run as administrator. So even if I go here, I can right click on this, run this as an administrator, UAC will present itself and I'm simply just going to say no. So I don't need it to do anything. Um, I don't want to send any requests in, um, anything like that. I just simply just say no to UAC. And what that does is forces the agent to wake up and check in. So if we go back to our admin portal and we go to our elevation events and we look at today, Let's change our view. Actually, I'm going to take this off just so we can see the raw list of events that are currently out there. And you can see there I am right there, and there was us asking for Edge. So you should see one event at least um, in your system that you can we can start to play with. And you can do this a couple times if you want to. You can go back and right-click, run as admin, pop a few applications in here. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to organize this screen a little bit. So before you get too many events in here, um, it starts to, obviously it's gonna get very long like an Excel spreadsheet, right? It's hard to see all those roles and figure out what should I be focused on. So what we wanna do is use the um, grouping capabilities of each of these screens to basically build your own data views. So it's a cool little party trick that I wish Excel had, but it doesn't. So let's go do that. So first we're gonna start with, um, we're gonna grab the vendor header just like this push it up here, slide it over, and you see there, drop it. That's gonna organize the screen much better. Now again, you probably only have one or two events in there, not a big deal, but when there's 100 or 200 events in here, very big deal. Now we're gonna grab name, drag that up here, and drop that right there as well. So that's our first data view. You're gonna wanna come over here and you wanna click on unsave data view, uh, unsave grid view, save grid view, and then when the box pops up, I want you to type in a name. So in your case, if this is your first view, there'll only be one line. Um, and just type in, in this case, we'll might call this one vendor or vendor name, um, however it makes the most sense for you. But go ahead and type a name in the box there, save that, that way it will remember it. So when we come back to the screen, whatever the last view you were using, that's what will show. So you don't have to keep making these over and over. Now there's another view that's gonna be important. So what we're trying to do and decide when we're looking at all of these events that are coming in is, do I need a rule for this or don't I, or should I? 
make a rule for that either for approval or for denial. And we're going to basically use um, a single event when we're creating a rule. And this is one of the reasons we group it kind of by vendor. So maybe I want to create um, a rule around Oracle utilities or tools like Java, for example, or something in Microsoft. And when you're doing requests and you have pop ups turned on, you can actually see um, live in the console when somebody's actually making a live request, which we're going to do too. So from here, another piece of data that's important to understand is uh, when we're making rules, if a file is file signed. So in this case, you can see publish assert verify is true. When they're file signed, obviously we want to try to use that as part of our rule criteria as much as we can. Not everything is file signed, um, but when they are, we want to make sure they're valid. And if that's available to us, we definitely want to use that. So in order to make sure when we're creating rules based on uh, essentially publisher certificates, uh, we need to know how many certificates are out there and maybe how many unique thumbprints, uh, the cert hashes for that certificate are out there. So another view that's going to be helpful if you scroll to the right, right about there, you can see this column right here. So you might drag that up and put that right in the middle of vendor and name. And what that does is this. See, now I'm in, I have Oracle, but look, I have two unique certificates. And guess what? Each one of those is covering Java. Now, again, probably have just one certificate in your system. If you're just getting started, that's okay. But as you get more and more and more events in the system, you'll start to see more situations like this. If I were to um, only make a rule based on this certificate right here, well, then only anybody running Java 8 update 181 would actually get approved. And folks running the SE runtime stuff over here, which is a little different version, well, they wouldn't because I didn't approve that thumbprint. And so it's very helpful to understand when you're making a rule um, how these things are, are presenting themselves in your system and, and how much you have out there that's unique to your environment. So what I want to do now is, now that I know this, I'll show you a couple different ways you can handle um, a situation like this. Uh, so let's start with, we're just going to pick one of these events. Doesn't matter which one. We're just going to pick one and only one. Um, if you multi-select, for example, and you try to convert to a rule, you're just going to see this screen. And, what, and you can do this. This will allow you to... Um, basically go through your list of events, check all the ones you think you need rules for, and then just simply say, create rule, approve. And then you just go to your rule list and then edit each one and, and basically tweak it to the way you want it. Today, what we're going to do is we're just going to take them one at a time so I can show you and walk you through building a rule with the rule builder. So we're just like one item right there, and we're going to say action, convert that to a rule. Now we're going to get the rule builder. Um, and so what this is telling us is, is what are they actually doing? So the UAC event info is at the top. Down here is the conditions in which we are either going to approve or deny this particular item. So we need to identify that and figure out what's the best way to do that. And you can use any combination of these fields in order to achieve that. And I'll show you some real quick combinations on, and how they might work. I always think of it this way. The left side of your screen over here is your if statement. The right side of the screen over here is your then statement. So we're going to start with, on the left side, some file attributes. Now, by default, we always trick, we always uh, essentially use the file hash, or we target the file hash, which in most approval situations is not how you want to do it just because there's so many versions. Every time this version changes, this file hash changes. So the minute 182 comes out, this rule is no longer any good if we're using file hash. So let me show you a couple different ways you could put this together. So I'm going to start by just doing this. We're going to ignore file attributes for just a moment. We're going to go look at the publisher details. You have two choices here. You can use the certificate hash. This is the unique thumbprint for this certificate. If I were to make the rule based on this, knowing that we have two Oracle certificates, then I would have to make a rule for this thumbprint 
and then I would have to find the other thumbprint and make a rule for that one, right? So then I would have two rules that would cover two thumbprints and allow these two different things signed by these two different certificates to have elevation. Um, that's a choice. This is the more specific way. If you want to make a more open rule, um, and I, I would say something like the one rule to rule them all, if you will, um, then you can use something like subject elements. And what I find is, uh, more often than not, C, N, O, L, S, and C tend to match the most. So this is how Oracle fills out their certificates every year when they expire and they buy a new one. That's generally how they fill it out. Now, OU does tend to change. Uh, if I was trying to keep you within this particular area, then I, I might use that as well. But for the most part, if I'm trying to make a more open rule um, so that I could cover maybe any version of Java, you know, I'd probably want to use something I, I felt was more common. So I can do this, that, that one, that one, that one. These are all and, by the way, not or. So now this rule basically states the following. If the publisher is Oracle and it's verified, and these fields match, then we will approve an admin elevation. And we're gonna say, we're gonna make us global for all companies. And that's fundamentally how the rules work. And now this is a very open rule. This basically says anything, any software published on any certificate from Oracle, past, present, or future potentially, is now approved. And you might think, wow, that's pretty open and Oracle's pretty big, I probably don't wanna do that and you would be correct. So let's go narrow the scope of the approval a little bit. So now let's go down here and say, well, since Oracle was kind enough to fill out the product name, not everybody does, you cannot insert data into these fields that was not otherwise here in the first place. Because uh, this is doing basically a match against the event. So if you put something new in, and they've never filled that out, it will never match, you'll never get an approval. But you can use wildcards and regular expressions. So for example, I don't necessarily care about which version of Java that they're using, I just wanna let them do any updates. So we could do something like this, we put a little asterisk there. And now we just went from approving anything from Oracle on any certificate to any certificate but it's gotta be the Java platform, right? And we notice there's different setup files and file names. Um, and so we don't necessarily need to, I don't necessarily in this case wanna mess with that because there can be different file names with different versions in it. And what I really just care about is as long as it's the Java platform, I'm okay with that. And then so now it'll match if the product is the Java platform, regardless of whatever version might come behind it, and the publisher is Oracle, it's verified, and these subject elements match, or if you're doing cert hash, the cert hash matches, then we will approve an admin elevation. Now you can approve or deny, and then over here, there's two different types of elevations. Um, the first one is admin. So think of this as like an over the shoulder admin. Like if you were to log into somebody's computer and type your credentials, that's basically kind of what we're emulating. The other one is a user elevation. Now admin's going to work probably nine times out of ten. User elevation is about when we have to pass admin in context. Certain applications that are installed like in a profile like Revit and sometimes Dentrix and things like that. Um, I need to be, I need the user to be the administrator. Um, and in that situation, then I would do a user elevation. Or if I'm doing like UNC file pass in a domain or uh, map drives or something like that, um, or context is important like the registry, then I might do a user elevation. Otherwise, everything else is probably gonna come out to be admin. And if you have any questions, there's a little link right there. Just click the article and you can read a little bit more about it. Um, our level, you know, we're gonna try as much as possible to apply things globally that way we don't have to continually make um, more rules than we might necessarily need for ourselves. So for example, Java, maybe half, half the folks use it and half the folks don't, but it doesn't really matter if I apply this as a global rule. If you're using it, it'll work for you. If you're not using it, you don't know about it, probably doesn't much matter. Um, as long as it's verified, even if they did install it, it really wouldn't matter. So we try to look at it 
a little bit like that. So otherwise, if you have, um, you know, if you try to set up the same rule for three different groups and you have 10 different ways of organizing things potentially, um, you know, you might recreate the same rule over and over again, and it's just more administration for you. But again, it comes down to acceptable level of risk. The ability is here to build rules at whatever level you want and whatever way that you feel is the most secure way to achieve that. Um, these are just some basic recommendations. Um, and that way, when we use these other levels, I generally use them for more specific, like things that I wouldn't give to everyone. Um, I had to create a, a group of engineers uh, for one, and we had to give them access to device manager. Definitely don't wanna do that at this level. So we, we put them in a group, a location, and we organize them all together, and then we just applied that specific rule so they could do that, and nobody else can. These do have hierarchy, by the way. It starts down here and then goes up. So computers can override everything above. Location, everything above that. And company can override global. And it doesn't matter if it's approved or deny. That doesn't matter. It's the level that matters. Because you may need to deny here and approve here. And you might need to approve here and deny here. Either way, that will work. And the last thing on rules, and there is an advanced rules video that goes more in depth and has some different examples. Um, I recommend you watch that. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, but for now, we're going to wrap this up on the rulemaking with the friendly name. Now, this is an important process. What I recommend here is putting in something that is very descriptive um, to what you did right, the way the rule is created, so you, that you can just read the friendly names later and it will help you tremendously. So now, in this case, you can kind of see here, um, uh, you know, we can say I approved uh, Oracle's Java using the publisher cert, um, and we'll say in this case, subject, right, and I put the year that this cert happens to expire, which you can see if you go right there. So this is an older version, um, and this cert expired a while ago, right? So there's other new certs that are out there, uh, which is helpful for doing a rule, in this case, um, by the subject elements, because any newer certs or versions would also more than likely be approved, because this is probably always going to match. And then when you're done, the other reason for that this is important right here is because you can make rules when a request comes in. So if I create the rule for you in sort of a quick rule fashion, like I approve a request for all companies, that will make a rule, but it only makes rules targeting file hashes. And based on what we just learned, we're probably gonna wanna edit and reconfigure those rules that we might create here. Um, and an easy way to identify which rules you have been working on versus rules that came in from a request that were generated kind of for you, this friendly name will be blank. So if you're following this process and you're naming all of the rules that you are deliberately creating, then if you go into the rule list and you see blank friendly names, you should edit every single one of those rules, make sure they do exactly what you want. It's an easy way to admin rules just simply using a little process like this. When you're all done and you've named it, just click Save, and that will put the rule into your Elevation Rules list. You may have to come in and click a little refresh there, but your rule will show up. And if you notice, we have all of these rules, and they're all named by what they do. So I can easily just read through, it doesn't matter how many rules I have out here, I can read through and kind of figure out what they do. And if somebody has created a rule from a request or anything like that, I will be able to see that because the friendly names will be blank. See, we're doing really good in our system. So we've got all of them, right? And so, oh, look at that. We got a couple rules with no names in them. So and I'm not sure what they do. Don't really like those. So if I don't like them, I can simply delete them or um, I can go in and edit and just tweak that rule um, to be a little more minimal to the way that I want it to be. And then when I'm all done, I will put a friendly name. And then I know that rule is good to go. I don't need to mess with it anymore. 
All right, so that's rules. Um, and that's a, a huge part of the system and a huge part of using testing, validating, and making sure that things work. So let's do that. Let's see if this works. So if we look at our elevation rules, you know, we've got this Java rule that we've created and we're working on a whole bunch of stuff. So let's go see if that works. And the first thing you want to do is go to computers, find your system. You're going to do actions, set to live. Okay. Now, while we're doing that, we're going to come also come back in here, do action again, and we're going to set blocker mode to audit. So I haven't really talked about blocker yet. Basically, what this is going to do is allow it to evaluate the system, see what's being utilized and what apps are being utilized, and basically compare that to our curated list of applications that are recommended to be blocked. So it's going to take about 48 hours of runtime for um, Blocker to uh, essentially create some recommendations on what it should, what you, what it thinks you should block. So for now, all you need to do is just set Blocker mode to audit, just let it go, go ahead and set elevation mode to live. That will turn the agent elevation mode into live mode and blocking mode into audit so we can start to evaluate and get some recommendations built up. Now, let's go check our rule. So once you do that, um, an easy way to get your agent to check in while you're testing, because nobody wants to sit and wait 10 minutes for the agent to check in, um, is just trigger a UAC event. Doesn't really matter what you do, you can simply just right click, find an application, run it as administrator. When it UAC presents itself, you can simply click no. If you are an admin, while we're doing this process, don't try to hit the yes, no on UAC. Yes, you can bypass us if you're an administrator because you're an administrator, which is one of the reasons why we wanna take away everybody's administrator rights because they can basically do whatever they want, um, including mess with our security tools. So go ahead and do a UAC event. The agent will check in. If you wanna check it really quick, you can always come back to the portal, refresh it, and that should say live, and then that should say audit. Okay, now we wrote a rule for Java. So let's test, I happen to have a Java file, let's test it. Um, and again, whatever you wrote your rule for, whether you're just playing around with Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome or an Office application, um, you wanna test that, make sure it works. And the easy way to do that is simply to run it. Now, if you are an administrator still, um, you will see yes, no. I am not, you saw the credentials go in, this now is elevated, this works perfectly. So it is a very simple application to test and ensure that it is doing what you need it to do. It will either do an elevation or it will do this. If we, the policy isn't quite matching right, um, or maybe we didn't set it up exactly the way we, we needed to, when you try to do something that isn't covered by a rule, then you're going to get a different set of screens. Now my screens are all customized. So currently at the moment, more than likely yours are not. So this will just say, we see you're trying to run, is this correct, right? That's the, gen that's the generic dialogue. You can customize this, and I will show you a few things on that. So first and foremost, this dialogue box has some different components to it. So we're gonna remember this for customizations in a few minutes. This is your, what's called the alert title. And you, this is a fixed field that you can set in settings. So it will always say whatever you put there. So mine says admin access assistant. You might say privilege access management, whatever you wanna do there. This is the alert, um, the message title override. So in some of the dialogues, this one specifically, um, then you can override the title. So if this bar, if this box, is part of the dialogue, then you can override the title. This section here, from here all the way down to there, right there. Now all of that is the message override. So you can put HTML in the message override and that will basically allow you to create stuff just like this. Now when you submit this, it's going to send it in as a request. So in this case, and you should have about a one minute timer set by default. 
So I'm going to go ahead, uh, mine's set a little bit shorter, so I'm going to just run through this really quickly just so we can see it doing uh, the approvals. So we're going to say yes, timer is up, you're going to go to elevation requests, you're going to find that request, and then I'm just going to simply um, say no because I don't want this one to run, and I'm going to say okay. So we've dispositioned that, and if you come back over here, you can see immediately denied on the endpoint and then the dialogues are going to go away you can see if you have your desktop notifications turned on you'll see it pop out like that if you don't you have to go in your window settings turn your notifications on and then you can go into the uh, browser settings and turn notif allow notifications for that app for our app now if you wanted to approve something um, the same the same process would work so if we were to go here, now let me show you a couple things really quick before we do that. So I'm gonna go back and review this really quick too. So some of the things you're looking at when you're approving or denying items, one of the key things is this stuff right here. So you can see that the publisher is not certified. So, hmm, don't like that. And then, you know, there's some scans here and I can review that. You can check this. And there's secure age thinks this is malicious and you can check the details. It's not file signed, right? And so overall, it's an old program, not file signed. I don't really trust the version of it. So I'm gonna, I, know I said, no, don't really like it. Now let's look at one that, um, you know, that kind of passes all of our security checks, right? And so let's do that really quick. So you can just see what that process looks like. I'm gonna go back to my request screen. Um, I do have this organized a little bit so you can see right there and I can see what's being asked for and you can simply find this in the headers and drag it up here find this drag it up here click on um, save and then you can create a grid view uh, just like this one so let's say I want to do something um, so I am trying to run um, handbrake a different application we're going to say yes. I'm going to do this really quickly. So there is our pending. All right. All the checks pass. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm just going to give them a one-time approval. Anything else creates a rule. This does not. We'll say okay. Let me go back to our system. We'll go ahead and close that. There. So now all of these checks have passed. I've given it, it's an approval one time. Um, all the details, I know the application. We come back over here and it's told us, hey, you are good to go. You have been approved. So if they want to, if you want to launch it and test it, you can watch the credentials. Again, if you're an administrator, don't rush to hit the yes, no button, which is a pretty common habit. Um, let the process play out. Um, if you truly want to see it work as, as the way it would be an end user, you can try taking away all your privilege, or you could create another user that doesn't have any privilege. But if you're going to just do some testing and, and just validating that it's actually doing what it's supposed to, don't rush to hit the yes, no buttons if you're still an administrator. So I'm going to say, okay, watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead, run UAC again. You're going to see credentials go in. It's going to start up in an elevated state, and we are good to go. All right, so that's using it in live mode. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you either It's either going to run a policy. If there's no policy, it's going to send it as a request, and you're going to either say yes or no. Um, and then that will do the either do or not do um, the elevation at that point. So that should kind of walk you through the kind of testing. Now just set whatever apps you need. Make sure that they behave the way you expect them to. And, um, you know, your rules are the way you want them. And then you should be good to go. Now the next thing I want to do is show you how to use technician mode. So if you haven't um, at this point, I recommend pause the video and then go download the Auto Elevate Notify app and get logged into that and then come back and resume the video. So now that you've done that, um, I'm going to bring this up. I have this as a shortcut on my desktop. The way you're going to access it is Control, Alt, A. So just remember that key combo. If you forget that combo, 
right? When the agents are in live mode, you can also bring it up in our dialogues. So a lot of our dialogues will have a little link in the corner right there that will essentially do the same thing. It's going to bring up the QR code, the same as Control Alt A. Um, if you're using remote control like Screen Connect, for example, we have a little batch file that you can download and put in the toolbox. And it basically just creates a little uh, run path to this program right here, right? So you don't put this on your desktop. This is strictly for demo purposes, but it's just a link to the program. It's in the auto elevate directory. Um, and a lot of remote control tools have that ability. We'll either accept the control alt a key command or, you know, you can make a little shortcut to it. So we're going to bring up the QR code. We are going to put the agent in technician mode. So this is how a technician would use auto elevate. You can basically um, manage and administer any computer without an administrator account, without you being an administrator and just having your cell phone. So I'm opening up my auto elevate app. If you're iOS, it's top left as a scanner and I think Android's top right. So we're going to scan this. There we go. We've scanned in. The agent immediately turns itself into technician mode. And now you're going to see it's going to behave a little differently. So when I want to do something, I can just do it. And then UAC is going to look a little different. So now we've got all of our basic information that we saw back in the console about this system. Um, this is pretty normal for some of the Windows OS files. Um, they are signed. It's just not file signed in the traditional sense. Um, but if I want to do an elevation, you can either do an admin elevation or user elevation. User elevations are going to require you to enter the password. Um, and if you're wondering where that password goes, it goes into the credential manager, never leaves the system. So we don't know what it is. It's just for the agent to be able to do things like this. So now I have elevated as the user. And if we do a who am I? because I've already input my credentials. They are in Credential Manager um, and they don't go anywhere. So you can see I actually elevated this while I was in the session. And if we go back and look over here, you can see that I'm just a standard user. I don't have any, any admin abilities, but yet there I am and I've elevated this, right? And so that is part of, of when, especially when it comes to doing things like this. So if I'm gonna try to get to the registry hive, for example, um, you know, like I said, most times admin's going to work just fine. But in this case, I do need it to be context specific. Now I'm in my part of the registry, which is exactly what I wanted. So that's how you use technician mode. Um, and when you're all done, this will time out, default time out after 15 minutes. You can change that, extend it, shorten it, whatever you think is, is best. But I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to turn that mode off now. And now it's going to immediately turn everything back on again, all the policies, rules, everything like that. Um, and now there's another area called uh, just-in-time admin login that we want to talk about. But first, we've got to go back and set that up. So let's go back to the admin portal. And we're going to do some settings now. because so we've been through um, the elevation events. We've organized it. We've been through the requests. We've answered some. We've said yes. We've said no. We've made some rules so that we can practice with that. Uh, we've turned blocker on. So it's auditing at the moment. So it's just going to run in the background. That's going to take a few days. Um, and then it will make some recommendations. So when it is done, it will recommend just like this. And then you can choose to add those blocking rules. And once you do that, then you're going to want to go ahead and turn it on. And then you would switch right here, set blocker to live, and now it will follow those rules. Um, so it's a very simple tool to use. It is not very complex. It's just there as a proactive security measure to block some of the tools and utilities that are known threat vectors for um, a lot of different types of attacks. Um, and it's going to help to block those. Uh, but that's going to take a couple days, so just let it run. Now, let's go down to settings. Okay, so we're going to scroll down just a little bit. This is the multi-level settings screen. Now, here is your global settings. So these settings apply to everyone 
and everything in the system. So if I were to go in and customize my dialogue messages with my logo and some different text and information, that would apply to everybody. But what if I needed to make custom dialogues, maybe just for one group of people, right? Now this is a multi-tenant system, I'll point that out. This is used both in internal IT and in the managed services space. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, privilege is an IT issue. It's not unique to one type of use or another, um, but the system is multi-tenanted and you can set it up accordingly as a single entity or multi-entity, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if I want to create unique settings, then I would apply those up here. So you simply click plus and I would create a new setting. So I could go there and say, well, we're going to change this by maybe group of systems. Uh, yes, you could even do an individual system, um, a whole company. And we could say, you know, this particular company, we want to create a whole entirely new set of dialogue messages unique to that company. Then we, this is exactly how you would do that. And you can do it with any one of the settings that is available. And most of them are actually in there. So let's walk through two key areas, agent customization and behavior and agent security. Those are the areas that we're going to cover. The admin portal, pretty self-explanatory. Change colors, put your logo up here in the corner, make it look and feel how you want. But this one, we're going to focus on a few key areas and things that you can do here. So there is your alert title. I was pointing that out in the dialogue that we saw just a few minutes ago. In our case, you can see where it said CyberFox Admin Access Assistant. Now, that's, that's going to change for every dialogue that has the little title in the corner. Now, if we want to customize a little bit further, then we were going to simply click the pencil on Agent Dialog Overrides. And then I'm going to recommend you click this article. Scroll down here and grab this PDF file. So when you first ran um, that request and you were testing, um, it came up and said, we've noticed you tried to run. And then of course your file name was there. And then the message override, is this correct? Now that's not scaring anybody away, obviously. They're gonna be like, of course I wanna run this. So what we wanna do is kind of customize that a little bit. In the pre-request, there is a title that you can change. That was that your header under the alert title. So, in this case, we've customized that. And then this section right here, from here all the way down, center to center, that is the message override. It's HTML. This is very simplified code to make this easy. Um, what you can do is literally just copy this and um, paste it in here. So if we take go back over here, we go to the pre-request, we take all that same code and we just paste it in, then your dialog will look exactly like that. Now, if you want to change the logo quickly and easily, what I recommend is open up your website in another tab, um, navigate to your page, and then find your logo, and then right click on it and just say copy image address. And then you can come in here and remove this section right here, and then just paste it with your image address, and then your logo should show up. Maybe customize the phone number, move this text around a little bit if you feel like you need to, and then you'll have your first message customized, okay? And then you just continue all the way down. Each one is relatively self-explanatory as to when it's going to come up and in what situation that message will come up, and then you can customize and tailor that accordingly. So I recommend using that file. It'll be helpful. There's lots of great examples for you to steal in there. So the rest of these are pretty good, just-in-time admin login. So what this does is allows us to log into a machine. So all the whole time we've been talking about is we're logged into a desktop and we're doing elevation either through policy or requesting it or we're doing it through a technician capabilities. But what happens when we get somewhere and it looks like that? Well, that's where just-in-time admin login is going to come in handy. And this is how we turn it on. So now we're going to go in here. This should be disabled in your system. Simply click the pencil, enable it. You're going to need to put an account name. 
do not use anything you have currently in use today. We will override the password. And we don't know what it is. So they're all stored locally. They're all random. They're all 127 characters. And we have no way of getting them. So don't pick an account you already have. Make it something funky and unique to this. Because we are going to create this account and then delete it when you log out. So it's just going to keep creating and deleting, creating and deleting every time you log into a machine using the admin login process. Now, if you do this frequently and for certain machines, and sometimes the profile build time can take a little bit of time, then it might be easy just to uncheck this box, and that will leave the user after you log out, but it will be demoted. It will not be an administrator. We don't use any standing admin accounts in Auto Elevate for anything. Everything is done just in time. So once you're going to set that, then you can also set the logo. This logo is uniquely specific to just in time only. So once you set logo, it's very tiny, 192 by 192. So it's just a little tiny, tiny, tiny um, that you want to use there. And then um, there's your, your timer interval, right? So a lot of times, you know, 60 seconds goes by pretty fast. While the timer is running, the agent leaves the TCP connection open to the server. So when you respond, it responds to the desktop immediately. When the timer expires, the agent goes to sleep. So, and the check-in timer is 10 minutes. So it might take up to 10 minutes. So if you're gonna do just in time, you might wanna give yourself a little more time. So maybe setting this value to 300 for five minutes or 10 or 600 for 10 minutes, if you wanna do that, um, it'll give you a bit more time. It's, you know, for them, it's a reasonable amount of time to wait. Generally, in a lot of cases, they may have to wait much longer, right, than, than 10 minutes or five minutes. So this is a huge upgrade uh, comparatively. So just set your values there. And that's pretty much what we need to look at in agent customization. Now let's go to agent security and some key ones here. So the first one is excluded admin users. So if you're going to maintain a break the glass administrator zombie apocalypse happens account, then and you don't want us to try to remove it, you need to put the name of that account here, just the display name. So you can see like we did this one, um, it doesn't really matter. It's whatever the display name is, you don't need domains or anything like that. Just if it's called, you know, uh, ABC123 admin, then just put ABC123 admin. Um, remove admin. So if you turn this to enabled, you're going to want to make sure any break the glass accounts are up here. This is disabled by default. And it will not, even if this is turned on, if your agents are still in audit mode, right, on the initial install, then they're not going to abide by this right now. So audit mode is do no harm. So if you're onboarding new clients and you have this turned on, it's not going to remove any local admin accounts until you actually switch them to policy or live mode. So while you're onboarding, you got nothing to worry about. You should be good to go. And this one here is the just-in-time admin login authorization. So who, because you can specifically control the permissions on this, who's allowed to do the administrator login, aka when we go over here and we want to actually just log in, right? then who's allowed to actually do this process and scan the QR code. Um, and so you want to set this first. If you don't, then nobody's allowed to use it by default. So when you try to scan the QR code, it won't work. So what you want to do is click edit. You can do roles or users. You don't need to do both. So if you pick admins and you're in the admin group, you don't need to add your name there as well. Just simply pick a role. Now, if there is an individual person, that I want to allow who isn't a member of one of these, I can add them as an authorized user. Think maybe a co-managed situation, right? So once those are set, again, you're gonna wanna let the agent check in so that we can install the credential provider. Um, so give it 10 minutes for the agent to check in, or you can, again, you can go in here and trigger a UAC event that will force the agent to check in, install the credential provider, and then once they do that, you can lock that computer. You should see this will always be at the bottom. And you're simply going to click there, click that, 
and then you will take your cell phone with your auto elevate app and use the QR scanner and scan that it will build you an administrator account that you set in the settings and it will automatically log you in. Um, your technician mode timeout, uh, again, usually this is enough. Um, a machine doesn't necessarily need to stay in tech mode, especially if you're on a server or something and you have any long running processes, maybe it's going to take an hour to do this installation or an update. Once you've set privilege, you're good. It doesn't need to stay in technician mode. Generally, this is okay, but you can adjust this globally to be shorter or longer if you need it to be, um, or you can set it by customer if you want to. Um, the rest of these relatively self-explanatory, the mobile app, um, if you want to add additional, authentica additional authentication layers to it. Um, and if you want to set up single sign-ons, currently with Azure AD only, um, and this is real easy, basically enable SSO, and then it will take you to Azure, and then you can follow the instructions and just kind of go from there. Um, it is very simple to set up. It only takes about five or ten minutes to do this. But otherwise, you should be on the path to success. So hopefully um, you learned a few things, you learned some new tips and tricks, uh, you're able to get through the application, get everything going, working the way that you need. If not, of course, please reach out and let us know. But otherwise, have a great day. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much.